these high reliable organizations like NASA, uh, the airline industry, nuclear power plants, etc. Mm -hmm. um, there has been uh, some bad lessons there as well, right now in Japan mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. Working with these high reliable organizations, where do you think that we should look in order to inspire the oil and gas companies? Well, that's interesting you bring up nuclear power plants. In our country, they've been pretty reliable since, in the U.S., they've been pretty reliable since 1979 when we had the Three Mile Island accident. And then uh, the nuclear industry itself moved to develop an in-house um, organization that they all pay into, which does extra, uh, extra um, regulation. It's not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is our regulatory agency, but this does extra regulation, does some training and stuff like that. Last year, I went to Japan. That's nothing. In 2002, I worked for BP, and look what happened to them in 2005. Oh. And that's just because they didn't do what we told them to do. Of they didn't course. do any of the things we told them to do. So last year I went to Japan and I was asked to Japan by KEPCO. This company is TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company. And the other company that I was asked to work in, I put a team together to work in, was KEPCO, Kansai Electric Power Company. And they run some nuclear plants too. And it wouldn't have taken 10 minutes to figure out, for anybody to figure out, that, that country, by the way, wants to become the leader in Asia for the development of commercial nuclear power. It didn't take us 10 minutes to figure out they can't run their own plants. They're extremely dangerous. You look around, things are sloppily done, the maintenance is not done. Uh, the press is right on this one. The press is saying today that they're, they're very inward looking, they won't tell anybody what they're doing. Well, that's the Japanese and they're still doing it. And you can't run those plants with that kind of a cultural uh, heritage. So after three days, I picked a pretty good team of Americans to go in, an engineer, uh, a sociologist, and myself, and we heard about all the research they were doing and we heard what they were running. Of course, they would, would they let us see a nuclear power plant? No. no. We exited in three days saying, if they don't do more and better training, if they don't quit being so closed mouth, if they don't quit making all the decisions at the top, they're going to get into trouble, and we don't want to have anything to do with it. And guess what? Their neighbor got into trouble. So you can look around and see some of these things and it can be very clear. And so what I would do is go in and, and try to change the whole thing. It's very hard to do. They weren't going to change. But we still consider nuclear power plants as being high reliable organizations. Well, I, well, as I said, a high reliable organization can turn into a low reliability organization you know, in an instant. Mm -hmm. I would consider all of those in Japan to be medium or low. Okay, so they could actually learn something from the oil and gas companies. Yeah, now, now let me put a caveat on that because tomorrow morning we'll probably have an earthquake in San Francisco, which is where I'm from, and the caveat would be, it, you know, if you have nuclear power plants in dangerous areas that, that can be exposed to earthquake and stuff, you're probably going to get a problem anyway. And so um, that would have... probably the, the, All the nuclear power plants in Japan are boiling water plants, and we're building... We, the U.S., is actually building and selling to other countries power plants, uh, nuclear power plants that are, are much safer and better than that. Now, I know you don't have any and have mm -hmm. not put your faith into that, and I think that's an excellent idea. But because you don't want to have anything around that's particularly dangerous, you know. But if we didn't have things around that weren't dangerous, we wouldn't do anything. The astronauts wouldn't have gone to the moon. No. So. Okay, so looking at NASA and the airline industry is probably a better, uh, that was a better deal than looking at the nuclear industry right now. Yeah, the, uh, the commercial aviation industry worldwide is pretty good right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not had too many troubles. The European rate is a little lower than the Canadian US rate, but not so much as you, unless you were in one of those planes that crashed, not so much as you'd notice it. So it's just, a, the line's just a little further down. I'm looking out here. Nobody's saying anything. Okay, so, uh, Carleen, <laughs> you, you spoke about uh, looking at the bigger picture. Uh, don't micromanage. Be a good leader in that way. Right. Um, and get those people that are necessary to do the job and that you should be the, the captain. Do you mention these things? Um, I'm thinking, is it, a, is, it a, is it a bigger problem with these HRO organizations or is, it, is this just common? Well, if they are HRO, they already know that yeah. and they do it. it. What's the problem 
there's always a problem changing any organization. The, de the devils you know are always better than the devils you don't know. And so changing any, no organization likes to change very much, and it's a problem. And when the leadership in the organization is arrogant, it becomes more of a problem. We train MDs in our country that they're God. And so now you get them out in a transplant operation, you say, oh, we should have one MD who's got the big picture, and then we should have a major surgeon here and a minor surgeon there. And they're looking at you saying, huh? Because they think, so we've had to retrain transplant teams. We haven't okay. managed to retrain the rest of them, though. <laughs> so the last question, and a very personal question, uh, I'm thinking being a good leader or, and also a good e-leader, actually mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. communicating in the right way to the people that yeah. you have to communicate to. Uh, it being a problem, actually putting uh, smileys and stuff like that on it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking maybe you're talking more about uh, men. It, it, do, you, do you have more men leaders that you actually are studying? Or uh, No, but I bet if I did that, I bet if we did that study, all of us could do it together, we would find that because males are raised, in, at least in my culture, males are raised to be pretty independent and to be pretty authoritative and stuff, we would find that males are, are worse at that communication function than females, just naturally. But you can train anybody. I know a bunch of males that are very good communicators. In fact, <laughs> the other... <laughs> The other day, I had to introduce our 22nd Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, the economist Robert Reich, to an audience. And I have never met anyone as skilled at talking and communicating as Robert Reich. I can understand why President Clinton wanted him as his Secretary of Labor. You can agree with his politics or not, but boy, can he tell you and you'll understand what he's saying. And he does it in a lovely way. So uh, there, there's an example that I would bet you we have, a, a, well, not we, we have the worst politicians in the whole world, but I bet you that there are some politicians who are just very good at that, at that kind of thing. Okay, we'll throw in a couple of smileys the next time. Okay. Thank you very much, thank Professor Carleen <laughs> Roberts. Thank you.